Welcome to the EEV Blog. I'm your host, Dave Jones, and this is episode number Lucky 13. Now, one of the things I get the most comments about on my blog, apart from the uh, cheap Chinese multimeter blog, which uh, created an absolute furor, and uh, we'll get into that in you know a future blog, but one of the things I get the most comments about are oscilloscopes. People just keep wanting to know more about oscilloscopes, digital storage oscilloscopes in particular, and in more particular, uh, PC-based oscilloscopes, and um, whether or not uh, they're actually worth buying, whether or not they're a, they're, they're a good deal or not, uh, compared to a more traditional bench oscilloscope like this Rigol or a Tektronix or an Agilent or a whatever. Now the most important thing, the number one requirement in an oscilloscope is the bandwidth, or more importantly, the analog bandwidth. And the analog bandwidth is the uh, bandwidth of the oscilloscope where it gets 3 dB down in its frequency response. 20, 30 years ago, uh, you know, a, a good entry level oscilloscope was uh, 20 megahertz um, analog bandwidth. And um, it hasn't changed too much uh, these days, but with the advent of high speed digital um, and um, microcontrollers and things like that, um, you, you really should be looking at probably around 50 megahertz minimum um, analog bandwidth for a general purpose um, scope, either a, either a bench scope like this or a, uh, or a PC based scope. The problem with uh, digital storage oscilloscopes has to do with um, sampling, of course, and this is where it complicates matters. Uh, a digital storage oscilloscope will have a traditional analog bandwidth, that's the bandwidth of its vertical front end, but uh, it will also have a sample rate um, which will determine the uh, what's called the single shot bandwidth of the oscilloscope. Now that's a very, very important requirement and that's pretty much number two on my list of requirements for a digital storage oscilloscope. It's sample rate. Now when it comes to sampling in a digital storage oscilloscope, there are two kinds of sampling. One is real-time sampling and the other is what's called equivalent time sampling. It goes under other names but it's um, it's usually known as equivalent time sampling and you'll see that on the data sheets. Now, what you want in a good quality digital storage oscilloscope is real time sampling. Equivalent time sampling is crap and it's, it's cheap and it's not very effective at all and I'll show you why. Right, now a real time sampling oscilloscope, what it will do is this is your input waveform a real-time sampling oscilloscope, if you're displaying one cycle on the screen, it will take samples at regular intervals like this. And it will do that at a very fast rate so that you get a lot of sample points per waveform. And then it will join the dots and it will reconstruct your waveform. Now, in a real-time sampling oscilloscope, what you want is a minimum, in practice, what you want is a minimum of 10 samples in your, uh, in your sampled waveform. Now some manufacturers like uh, Tektronix for example will claim that you only need two and a half times or maybe even five times the, um, uh, the, five times the uh, analog bandwidth in sample rate. So a, they will claim that a 10 megahertz signal, you'll only have to sample at 25 megahertz. And really, in practice, that really doesn't really work. You should stick to an effective rule of thumb of uh, 10 times the analog bandwidth. Now, um, a good modern oscilloscope like this Rigol will actually meet that. It will have a, um, well, a meet or exceed that times 10 rule of thumb figure. This has a one gig sample per second sample rate and an analog bandwidth of only 50 megahertz. So it's capable of um, giving you 20 points per um, your sampled waveform in real time. Now the other form of sampling, equivalent time sampling, is a cheat. Uh, really, it's, it's really cheating and it always has been. So let's take a look at how equivalent time sampling works. If this is your input waveform, which is a repetitive sine wave, for example, 
then what equivalent time sampling does is if you're only displaying one waveform on the screen like that, then what it does is it takes one sample from this one and then one sample from the next trigger point and then one sample from the next one and so on. And what it does is it slowly over that time builds up a picture of your input waveform. So you'll eventually get your, so and then join the dots of course, and you'll get your sine wave and or your input signal. And really that, um, you know, it sounds like an effective way to do it. And it, I've got to admit, it kind of is in, a, um, in some applications where it can give you a very high resolution um, sampling of your input signal in very high-end oscilloscopes like you know 20 gigahertz analog band with oscilloscopes they use this technique and um, you know it's it's actually quite effective but in low-end um, cheap oscilloscopes it's it's just garbage and it doesn't work in practice at all and now the problem with it is that it requires your input waveform to be perfectly um, steady and repetitive and in the real world your input waveform is rarely, um, you know, uh, rarely, uh, rarely meets that requirement. It's rarely repetitive and it's rarely um, stable over time. So equivalent time sampling, really in, in, in practice, it's a very poor technique. Now, the third most important requirement in a digital storage oscilloscope is its memory depth, its sample memory depth. And really, uh, what you should be looking at is, it's the same as analog bandwidth. You can, you can never have too much sample memory. And the more the better. Now a cheap, um, you know, low-end oscilloscope, um, like the uh, Tektronix series, they traditionally have only a couple of kilobytes of sample memory. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it was okay, you know, 10, 15 years ago when really that's all you had. You didn't have any options. But today's oscilloscopes, like this Rigor one that I've been raving about, is they, they can have sam memory sample depths of up to, you know, one million um, samples, one meg samples. And um, this is really fantastic because it allows you to zoom in on your signal under analysis. You can take all your measurements um, you, you can just hit the single shot button, you can take a capture, and then if you see any detail in the waveform you like, you can just zoom straight in. Big sample memory really comes into its own when you're doing uh, digital uh, troubleshooting, which is, you know, it's very common these days. It's probably one of the most common requirements of an oscilloscope is to, you know, debug digital electronics and serial protocols and things like that. If you're working on, say, a uh, SPI bus or a, you know, I squared C bus, or you're trying to debug some serial protocol, then a big sample memory is awesome. And, uh, but only, and it's also useful for traditional debugging as well. You can capture a waveform and you can, it means you, you can capture little glitches in there as well. You can actually zoom in and get all this fine detail. It's great. Right, so we've looked at the three fundamental uh, requirements for a digital storage oscilloscope. Analog bandwidth, sample rate and memory depth. Now, these things are, you know, you, you can't really, well, you can't separate the first two. Analog bandwidth and um, sample rate are really tied together in a digital storage oscilloscope. There's no point having a 50 megahertz uh, bandwidth analog bandwidth oscilloscope if you've only got a sample rate of 20 meg samples per second, because that means in practice, uh, your single shot bandwidth is only 2 megahertz. So your fantastic 50 megahertz bandwidth oscilloscope, um, you know, for a lot of practical uses, only is really only usable up to 2 megahertz for single shot work, which is, you know, a good majority of the work uh, most people have to do in electronics these days. So, you know, just um, really go for the big sample rate that allows you to get real-time sampling operation.